so that it was now full. And he was in the, in the part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him, and said unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he rose and rebuked the wind, and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was great calm. And Gather Scroll says, these miracles show that Jesus is God. Now here's a point. Here's a point to remember. Academic scholarship for over 150 years has always not valued the miracles. They've never seen them as valuable or historically relevant. So Gather Scroll is going against the grain when he's going into the miracles and expanding the miracles to show what these miracles signify. And he's saying that they signify Jesus is God. And, the, and he calls them the sea miracle, the calming of the storm, uh, etc. Yeah. And then if you go to Matthew 24 verse 5, Matthew 24 verse 5, It says, And many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. So, the name of Jesus was significant. The name of Jesus Christ was significant to the early church. When, the, when Peter went and healed people, he said, In the name of Christ, or in the name of Jesus, uh, get up and walk. Think about that from a Jewish perspective. A Jew at that time, the only name that is worth and speaking on behalf is God, the God's name, Yahweh. So when it says, when Jesus says, many shall come in my name, and he, and he says in, uh, at the end of Matthew, go, you know, go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the early church in the book of Acts, where they preach in the name of Jesus, it's obviously that he, that is, we're to see him as God because only the name of God was to be honoured. And yet Jesus is saying, in the name of Jesus, go in my name. We go in the name of God, but he's saying, go in my name. And there are many, many scriptures that we could look at. Let's go to Matthew 12, 21. Matthew 12, 21. Matthew uh, 12, 21. Get my dinner in a minute. Matthew twelve twenty one. Matthew twelve uh, twenty one says, "And in his name shall the Gentiles trust." So this is the Messiah. In his name the Gentiles trust. Well, what, the Jews were to trust in the name of Yahweh. Gather scholar, an eminent scholar, points that out. Uh, and he goes into intricate detail to back this up. So that's Simon J. Gather scholar, the pre existent son. That is a very important work to read if you want to be up to speed on academic scholarship, on uh, Christology. Uh, it's. It, it deals with and builds on uh, Richard Balcom, Hurtado and other scholars. Um, and if you want a book that will help you to answer Muslims and what they say about Jesus and Paul Williams and others, it's a book to get hold of and go and read uh, and will equip you. I'm not saying I agree with everything, but he is a Cambridge scholar, he's quite an eminent scholar and his book's very important to read. So now I want to just talk about another writer. I want to just make a couple of observations. Um, now a much more, not it's not um, in the higher echelonces of academia, of today, it's not seen as an important academic work, but in terms of a, an important classical theology book, it's very, very, very good and very important, and that is Lorraine Bottiner's book, The Person of Christ. Now, 
before we just read some of this book, I just want to have a caveat of, of just to talk just a little bit. For those who read books and those who are academics and, and those who are lay people, I want to just bring a caveat here and, and that's this. Academic scholarship uses the word low Christology and high Christology and it sounds very, very, very uh, helpful. If you read any academic book, if you go to any theological seminary or any university in the world and you're studying Christology, you will inevitably hear, hear the words high Christology and low Christology. Even Orthodox theologians, even uh, Orthodox Christian theologians who write books on Christology will use these terms high Christology, low Christology and it, and it is the meat and drink of academic scholarship. Very two simple words, but it kind of encapsulates the scholarship and the methods that are involved in scholarly work in Christology. But here's the point that I want to get at. As Christians, be very wary of taking these, this kind of language and imbibing it. Because every bit of this language is cram-packed, like like a chocolate eclair with cream, it is cram-packed with presuppositions that you'll catch without realising it. So be very, very careful. High Christology and low Christology. You see, the, the, the low Christology will say, well, what we'll do is there's no... Um, this is a bit technical, right? So hear, hear me out. The, the, many of the low uh, Christology brigade will say, when we're looking at low Christology, Jesus is a man. Uh, we'll, we'll look at the functions of Jesus and, and as we look at the functions of Jesus we'll, we'll see that he's just a man so that, that is a, a low Christology's methodology we'll, we'll look at the functional aspect the things that Jesus does and then from there we'll conclude who he is now there are some scholars just as, a, just as an aside that like Stein who've done that and come up with the idea that Jesus is God. Adolf Schlatter, a hundred years before, did that, looked at what Jesus did and said Jesus is God. But generally speaking, low Christology is, is the idea that we look at what he does and as we look at what he does we see that he's a man. A few others like Stein and Schlatter have said no, we look at what he does, he, he's God. But the point is, is there is an assumption there that there is no, here it is, ontological status with the Lord Jesus. That is to say, the being of Jesus is not God. Because we're not looking at his being, we're looking at his function. So, that methodology has an implication without you realising it, theologically speaking, and when you're looking at text. And the same for the High Christology Brigade. They'll have a, a methodology. What, what, what I'm saying is, academics have their language, but be careful to not just take it on board uncriti uncritically. Remember that to be a biblical Christian and to filter everything that you hear, academically speaking, from a biblical perspective. That any intellectual tools that are around, you filter them through the biblical perspective. That, that when you are an academic, you, you, you remember these intellectual tools and language are to be filtered through the Bible. All right? If you put the Bible at the front of your academic scholarship, if you put the Bible at the front of your reading of scholars, then you're going to be more discerning. And not only that, but that you make sure that you use the analogy of faith, that the biblical teaching of the Westminster Confession, the biblical teaching of the great theologians like Herman Bavi, that you use the, 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 the theology of the Bible, you use the Bible and the theology of the Bible to, to critique the language, academic language that you're imbibing and the books that you're reading. So be very, very careful. Filter everything through the Word of God, through the Bible. Filter everything through this book, the Bible, yeah? So we're near the end. Now, a scholar 
a, a theologian that you could read and get hold of this book. If you get hold of a book on this topic, get hold of this. The Person of Christ by Lorraine Botner. Uh, I don't know who publishes it today. You could get it PDF. You could get it secondhand. The Person of Christ by Lorraine Botner is worth its weight in gold. And he talks about Jesus is God. I just, I, I can't, I can't wait. I'm just going to have a little bite. Sorry. So, The Person of Christ by Lorraine Botner is a superb book. Brilliant theological book. Really, really helpful. If you're going to do apologetics down at High Park, get hold of this book. Alright? If you're going to do apologetics to Muslims, get hold of this book. The Person of Christ by Lorraine Botner. And if you're going to read Gatherskull and Dr. Kirk, if anybody's going to make the effort to read these books, make sure that in the reading you also read The Person of Christ by Lorraine Botner because he will give you more of an orthodox position. Gather Skoll will give you an academic position to defend against Dr. Kirk, but he's still an academic, and academics can be a bit weak in certain areas sometimes. Um, but uh, Lorraine Botner is n was not only an academic, but he was principally a theologian, a biblical theologian, and so therefore y you're much more safer in terms of it's going to be more and more 100% sound, as it were. So Lorraine Botner, and he, he, he talks about the person of Christ, and he, he mentions, I mean, his book's just absolutely brilliant, but is Jesus God? Well, let's look at John 14, 9. John 14, 9. So this, this soiree into uh, Christology and scholarship is just to to give you a taster that for you as a Muslim that there are answers to your questions that that we can show you from the Bible and from scholarship that what the Muslim scholars are saying and the apologist is wrong that the Bible teaches Jesus is God okay John 14 9 John 14 9 Jesus answered him I have been so long time with you and yet as thou not know me Philip he that have seen me has seen the father and how saveth thou show us the father so he's saying you see me you see the father from a Jewish point of view that's blasphemy John 5.23 John 5.23 John 5.23 says that all men should honour the Son even as they honour the Father. That's blasphemy from a, a Jewish point of view. You honour the Father, God. But he's, the Lord's saying, no, you honour the Father and the Son. Matthew eleven twenty seven 27 says, All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son, but the Father, and neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son. So, again, that's blasphemy because it's saying, the Son is saying, Jesus is saying, only I know the Father. Nobody knows him like me. And you can read uh, John chapter 5, verse 19, John chapter 10, verse 32 to 35, Mark chapter 14, verse 61 to 64, Matthew 28, 18 to 20. You can read Luke chapter 1 verse 17, Mark chapter 1 21, John chapter 1 verse 1. These are all passages that talk about Jesus being God. Okay? Um, we turn to Romans 9 5 and then we'll finish here. Romans 9 5. Who are the fathers, and of whom are concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all. God bless it forever. Amen. So Paul is saying here that Christ is God. Over all. Blessed. Amen. 
So that's the Lorraine bottom there. Throughout the history of Christology, So I would encourage you to read some of the creeds, read the Westminster Confession. In fact, um, I'm just gonna, I'll just be one second, I'll just be one second, I'm gonna get the Westminster Confession. Just have a look. Just look here. Have a look at. Uh, you see the horses there. See the horses. It's raining outside. So, this is uh, Studies in Theology by Lorraine Botner, and uh, this has the book Person of Christ in it, so you can get hold of this book as well, by Lorraine Botner second hand, so I have a look on Amazon, get it second hand, but that, a look at the Person of Christ and the Trinity, and uh, another book to get hold of is a classic work by Kriegel Publications, uh, Edward Henry Bickers Seth Steth, uh, the Trinity. There we are, by Kriegel Publications. Uh, that's a really helpful book on the Trinity. If you're an apologist and you're going to do debates and discussions, get hold of that book. It will really help you. If you're a Christian, you need encouraging. That book will really help you. So it's published by Kriegel. It's the Trinity, a classic study of. Biblical Trinitarianism, Henry, Edward Henry Bicker's death. Okay? So I'll get hold of that book. And another book to get hold of on Christology is the Westminster Confession. And uh, we're just going to read what it says on the deity of the Lord. So... See what it says about the Lord. Christ the Mediator. So we'll read uh, the Westminster Confession on Christ the Mediator, of Christ the Mediator, chapter 8. Excuse me, sorry. So we'll just read this and see what it says about who Jesus is. And... Uh, And then we're finished, and then I can have my dinner. So it says, It pleased God in his eternal purpose to choose and ordain the Lord Jesus, 
His only begotten Son to be the mediator between God and man. The prophet, priest and king, the head and saviour of his church, the heir of all things and judge of the world, unto whom he did from all eternity give a people to his seed, and to by him in time redeemed and called Jesus sanctified. The Son of God, the second person in the Trinity, being very and eternal God, of one substance and equal with the Father, did, when the fullness of time was come, take upon his man's nature with all the essential properties and common infirmities thereof, yet without sin, being conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost in the womb of the Virgin Mary of her substance, so that two whole perfect and distinct natures, the Godhead and the manhood, were inseparably joined together in one person, without conversion, composition or confusion. Take notice of this if you're an apologist at Hyde Park, Christian apologies. Very, very profound and very, very important. The Godhead and the manhood were inseparably joined together in one person. Here it is. Without conversion, composition or confusion. Which person is very God and very man, yet one Christ, the only mediator between God and man. So when the Muslim says, did God die? Did God do this? Did God do that in, in Jesus? You've got to be careful because it's saying here that there are two natures, the God-man and uh, the God-man, God and man. And there were two natures in one person. But notice what it's saying. This is very, very important and significant. And a lot of people are missing this at Hyde Park. A lot of Christian apologists and Muslim apologists are missing this. And a lot of academics today are missing it. A lot of Christians are missing it. Listen to what the Westminster Confession is saying. And this is classic Chalcedon theology. I'll read it again. So that two whole perfect distinct natures, the Godhead and the manhood, were inseparably joined together in one person. Without conversion, composition or confusion. Which person is God and very man, yet one Christ, the only mediator between God and man. So what he's saying here is that there is the Godhood of Jesus and the manhood of Jesus. Right? Godhood and manhood. And they came together in one person. They were one person, but they're not like this, entwined. They are two natures. And in some mystical way, they are one person. Okay? Very, very significant. Very, very significant. I, I tell you something, I'm not just saying this, but it, it, it staggers me. It staggers me at the brilliance of these theologians uh, of Chalcedon and after Cyril of Alexandria. Cyril of Alexandria was an absolute genius. Athanasius was an absolute genius and this book gets what the early church fathers were saying and this book is saying, look, listen again, it's really significant, really profound. So that two whole perfect and distinct natures, the Godhead and the manhood, were inseparably joined together in one person. So the God-man were joined together in one person, but listen now. Which person... Uh, without conversion, composition, or confusion. Okay? So, they became one. But their natures were not confused. There was a clear God nature and a clear man nature. Yeah, very, very profound. And that's what I wanted to bring your attention to there, is... You need to study the Westminster Confession and the Chalcedon Creed and the other church fathers and you need to get grapple with what it teaches about what they teach and what the scriptures teach about who Jesus is. He is the God-man. He is God and man in one person but they are, the natures are not confused. You say, well that's contradictory. How can it be one but they're not united? As in like confused, uh, like intermingled. It, it doesn't make sense. It's a mystery. It, it, it's a mystery beyond our understanding. All right. 
And that's what it's hinting at, really. It, this is beyond us. But the moment you start to say they're confused, you get into many, many philosophical and theological issues and problems, which the Muslims are, are exploiting down the Hyde Park. And it's because all of us need to be much more astute as to what the Orthodox position is concerning the deity of Christ. So I would encourage you to get a hold of the Westminster Confession. I'll just unpack it for you, okay? You had the Nestorians. Let me, let me, let me yeah, the Nestorians. The Nestorians said in, in the character of Jesus, there was the two natures. You had God and man. And they ran side by side. That's a hist that is a uh, heresy. Nestorianism is a, is, a, is a heresy. You got in the nature of God, in the nature of Jesus, you had the God and you had the man and they were like two side by side, never mingling like that. Right? Two wheels. That's a heresy. Then I can't remember exactly what they were called. I think they were the Eukit... You um, you. Eukitius, something like that. Yet the other side, the Eukitiuses, or I can't remember exactly the name. Um, and they believe that the two natures of Christ became one intermingled. Right? The problem with that is, is you run into philosophical problems once you say that, because you're saying the very nature of God changed. The very nature of God suffered. But how can God suffer when he is eternally God? He has always been and always be who he is, always the same. All right? So the, the, it, it brings some philosophical, theological problems. Chalcedon, Cyril of Alexandria... And the Westminster Confession are saying this, no, no, you have God, you have man, right? They are one person, they are one person, right? But the God-man's not changed, the man has not changed, but yet they are one person. So Nestorianism, God-man, one will, uh, sorry. God, man in the human nature, two wills walking side by side. You, I think it's you, you, Kittyism or well, something like that. Said not two natures became intermingled as one, like that. Chalcedon and here, Westminster say no, two natures become one. They're one. But well, the God nature has not been confused. All right. That is so profound. So profound. You cannot even begin to understand how profound. Philosophically and theologically, that is. But it's also biblical. Because in, if we turn to uh, John chapter 1. John uh, chapter 1. John chapter 1. So I, ho I hope I've un unpacked that for you. Let, let, let's just see. Let, I can, let, let's get that name for you. So we don't want to leave you. Let's see if we can get it in here. I don't think it's got the old scholars on that. The old early church fathers. In this. No, um, I'll, uh, 
for scholarly purposes, I'll be I'll be back with you in one minute. Forgive me. Just give me one minute. I'll take my sandwich. I'll see if I can get it. It's very important. Mm. Trying to find it for you, Fox. The name of that particular group yeah. I might have it here I might have it actually in my notes Sorry about this, folks. I can't find it. But um, if you have a look at Lewis Burkhoff's Systematic Theology and uh, read the chapter on the person of Christ, that will give you more background to uh, to the topic. Um, and I'll try and find the name of that other group, the Nestorians, and the other group. And I'll put it under the video, and I'll maybe link an article to that, or a, a lecture to that. So, particular topic. Um, there are there is um, some lectures on bio. Uh, Biola University on the the two natures of Christ and the person of Christ. Uh, by a, 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 an academic there, that's very helpful, and uh, so I'll I'll link to that and, and you'll find the information there for you. Uh, so yeah, I would recommend reading this as well on the person of Christ uh, and that will really help use uh, Lewis Burkhoff's Systematic Theology. So, we've finished now. We've finished our soiree into Christology and Biblical Scholarship or Modern Scholarship. So I hope that's been a help to you. And. Uh, the, these notes here that I made were was um, about 10, 12 hours research um, that and I've just given you a snippet of the research that I did. So I hope this research and, and the conversation that I've given you, I hope it stimulated you, I hope it's helped you. So we're going to close in prayer. And uh, and uh, I hope it's been a help to you, and I hope it strengthens your faith. Uh, I'm just trying to help you to 
I'm trying to help apologists who go down to Hyde Park just to be a bit more savvy academically. I'm trying to help Christians just to be encouraged that your faith can be defended. And I'm trying to educate people just to give you some idea of you can be an evangelical Christian and not be intimidated by academia. Yeah? And uh, I'm trying to help you to be more precise about your faith, more biblical about your faith, and more in touch with what's going on academically. And um, I hope that's been a help to you. And uh, So yeah, so this video is not for the faint-hearted. There's a lot of content in this video for you to get your head around and think about. And there's been a lot of books recommended to you. And I just hope that this Video. I'm, I'm sorry that I've made it while I've had a cup of coffee and, and a sandwich, but it, it's more it's more like a, a kitchen table uh, scholarship, <laughs> all right? Kitchen table scholarship where you're in my home and you can just see me chilling out. I'm chilling out today. This is a, a day off today. Um, I'm just uh, doing practical things that I need to do today. Um, so uh, that's where it's at today. So I. I so in the midst of that practical soiree, I've been reading, studying, and I've just got this scholarship out for you and, and information out for you today. And then I'm going to pray now and then get back to doing the practical things in the house. So God bless you. So let, let's just pray uh, and read a word, the Word of God. Let's uh, read uh, Philippians. So oh, yeah. So Philippians Philippians uh, chapter two verse six who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name which is above every name. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your goodness and your love. And Father, I pray that this video would in some way encourage people, help people, strengthen people. And Father, just be a blessing to people uh, that they might be aware of that they can defend their faith and that remain biblical, but also not anti-intellectual, just ignore what people are saying, or the scholars, Lord. But that we can uh, grapple with their ideas, but know that ultimately, your word is the standard of truth. Your word is a lamp to the feet. Your word is a light to us, Lord. And Father, we can be guided by your word, and that your word is the basis for reading, the basis for theology, and the basis for scholarship. Your word is truth, O oh Lord. And we give you the praise and the glory and the honour. And I praise and thank you for this day. Father, Son and Holy Spirit, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your blessings. And Father, I pray that you are blessed this day. That you bless my friends as they hear these words. And I pray that this video would be a blessing and an encouragement and a help and a comfort and a strength to them. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a lovely day. And I'll see you in a week's time. I'm busy. I've got other things to do. So I'll see you in a week's time. Uh, and God bless you. Have a lovely day. Take care.